city. Now I want to ask you to look at the reality of separation, and I want you to do it with a loving sense of urgency. I want you to recognize the consequence of lostness, to truly understand that if we say no, if we disobey, if we simply live in the status quo and don't go, the utter desperate state of those who are truly separated from God, those that are separated are those that are truly lost in their sin. And I want to ask you, are you comfortable with this reality? Comfortable enough to know that you've been set free and comfortable enough because you have to get here, Christian, to where you can speak honestly, frankly, and lovingly with humility to the reality of what it is to be lost in sin. Watch as David Platt walks us through what I pray will be a blessed understanding of this. Consider the testimony of Scripture to the lostness of man. Not three chapters into this book. Man is sinfully lost. Man is slandering the goodness of God. Let's eat from the tree. God doesn't know what is best for us. We know better than Him. Slandering the goodness of God. Spurning the authority of God. Even if God said, don't eat from the tree, we're going to do it anyway. He's not Lord over us. We can do what we want. This is the God who beckons storm clouds and they they come. The God who says to the wind and the rain, you blow there and you fall here, and they do it. This is the God who says to mountains, you go here and seas, you stop there. Everything in all creation responds to the bidding of the Creator until you get to man and you and I have the audacity to look at him in the face and say, no. Slandering God's goodness, spurning God's authority, and then questioning God's word. Did God really say? Oh, it is a dangerous, dangerous thing whenever we subject God's word to man's judgment. And from this sin, we see lostness all over this book. What does it mean to be lost? To be lost is to be cut off from God. Man cast out from God's favorable presence in Genesis chapter 3. To live alienated from God, Colossians 1.21, separated from Christ, Ephesians 2.12. Cut off from God and condemned by God. Romans 5.12 says, from that one sin came condemnation for all men. Romans 5.18, one trespass led to condemnation for everybody. In our sinfulness, we are cut off from God. Condemned by God. Enemies of God. Romans 5.10. Friends of the world with enmity toward God. James chapter 4, verse 4. In our lostness, we are slaves to sin. John 8.34, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Romans 6.11 says we are slaves to sin and impurity and lawlessness. We are slaves to sin and dominated by Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26 says we are caught in the snare of the evil one who has captured us to do his will. 1 John 5.19 says we live in the world that lies in the power of the evil one. We are children of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3. Lovers of darkness. We hate the light. John 3.20. Ephesians 4.18 says we are darkened in our understanding and it affects all of us every facet of our being permeated with lostness our minds are blinded Romans 1 21 says we claim to be wise but we are fools exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles verse 28 says God has given sinful man over to a depraved mind 
2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this world, little g, God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So in our lostness, we can't see. Our minds are blinded. Our emotions disordered. Romans 1, 26 says, God has given us over to our sinful hearts. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, the sinful passions of our flesh war against our souls. Our minds blinded, our emotions disordered, our bodies defiled. Romans 1.24 says God has given us over to sexual impurity for the degrading of our bodies of one another. Romans 3, there is no one righteous, not even one, no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Our throats are open graves. Our tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Ruin and misery mark our ways. In the way of peace we do not no, there is no fear of God before our eyes. We are morally evil. Genesis 8 and 21 says, Every inclination of man's heart is evil from childhood. Spiritually sick, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. And we are continually perishing. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. Do we see this? Our problem is not just that we've made some bad decisions. Our problem is not just that we've, we've messed up. Our problem is that we are at the core sinfully lost cut off from God, condemned by God, and consequently destined for hell. Friends, I show you that because my prayer is that God will give you a passionate empathy for the lost. And let me just make this personal because it's not about the lost in the third world country. It's the lost in your family. It's the lost in your neighborhood. It's the lost in your workplace. You see, I point you to the parable of the soils. Because so often we'll say, oh, well, they're fine. Or we grow callous to the reality of the lostness and the separation. And what that means, they're, gone, they're going to hell. And if we say, well, it's okay because they know these facts. Or they've expressed that they've had these feelings. Or they talk about this faith. The parable of the soils tells us that if there is not lasting fruit, then you and I have been called, as difficult as it may be, to look at them and see their lostness. I ask you, could you walk by children on fire and just say, well, they'll be okay? That's exactly what we do every time we rationalize away the call to be Christ to the lost, especially those closest to us. You say, well, they're not on fire. Yes, they are. They just don't know it yet. I ask you, do you have a burning passion for the lost? What kind of burning passion? Like the kind that would be willing to pick up your cross and follow Christ and his passion. Because that's where he found you and me. That's right where he found you and me. Romans 10, 14 and 15 make this personal. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching or going? And how are they to preach or go unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Friends, that's the call. I ask you, when you know the reality of separation from God? Can you remember what it was like when you were lost enough to surrender your life to Christ, to reach out and be an instrument of the king for the purpose of making disciples of the lost? This is the expression of loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. For you see, that's obedience to love your neighbor as yourself, to go, be his witnesses, go, make disciples. This is our call. I tell you, when you do, we'll step into the multiplication 
process, we will go to being the church in a way that becomes supernaturally blessed, supernaturally engaging. You and I will see God do what only he can do. And I want you to think about this. Isaiah says one will become a thousand. You see, when we try to man-make ministry and we try to do stuff, well, we might build a crowd and put a cross on top. But where and when God does what only he can do, when the people of God will seek out the people of peace and pour in and make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, God will do what only he can do. There's a beautiful exponential impact when the Holy Spirit does what I call real church growth. Get a sense of this quantitative reality, and then we'll pick back up. Ever wondered why Jesus' last command to his committed followers was to make disciples of all nations? Have you ever wondered what it would look like if Christ's most committed followers today actually carried forth that command according to the standards set forth in the New Testament by Christ in the Twelve? If an evangelist were to reach a thousand people a day for Christ in a frozen population rate, can you imagine how long it would take to reach the world for Jesus Christ? Just over 15,000 years. And imagine the spiritual maturity of these new converts, most of whom receive no real follow-up or discipleship and end up never reaching their full potential in Christ. However, if a committed follower of Christ, we'll call him Paul, were to disciple a new believer for one year, we'll call him Timothy, to the extent that Timothy matures in Christ until he is able to disciple another. For as Luke 6.40 says, the student will become like his teacher. So then, in year two, Timothy has become a disciple himself and takes on his first student while Paul takes on another student. By the third year, our Paul is discipling his third student while our Timothy is discipling his second student and our newest student is now able to make disciples as well. If the cycle is not broken, a spiritual downline is created which multiplies to the ends of the earth. Even at an accurate and growing population rate, do you know how long it would take in such a scenario to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ? Just under 37 years. And now imagine the spiritual maturity of these believers, all of whom have been equipped to both be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. This is why Christ's last command to his followers is not to make converts, but to make disciples of all nations. Friends, if you'll read your Bible, Acts chapter 2 will show you how. This happens through the power of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus promised. And if you go to Acts 16, you'll see the account of what we know as Lydia and her family, and then the Philippian jailer and his, and they both are demonstrations of what happened when we find the people of peace. When we take Jesus' strategy, who says, by all means, sow and share with all, but invest in those who whom you see me at work in. You see, friends, we're not here to create some kind of carnival for Christ. We're here to make disciples and bring him glory. When we do this, when we make disciples, stop going to church and start being the church. When we commit to making disciples, that's where and how one becomes a thousand. That's where and how the supernatural element of God's Holy Spirit begins to bless and move and do what only he can do. This is yours and my call. This is the Great Commission. You look at it and you see the early church in Acts 2, 42 through 47. How does this happen? By committing to being the body of Christ in koinonia on mission. Again, communitas, as Alan shared with us. Friends, there's a need to understand that if and when this doesn't happen, there's a realization to tragic disobedience. This image moved me when I saw that match curled away. So many look the part, but when life really gets lived out, it becomes obvious that it was loveless all the while. Oh, it looks the part, it plays the part, it talks the part, but there's no fruit in the faith. It was really a matter of facts and posturing. There's a realization that you and I have to embrace and I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 7. You heard Francis talk about the narrow and the broad way. 
and the reality that it represents. Well, you know, if you pick up on the very next verse where Francis stopped and you read from verse 14 to the end of the chapter, you'll see a very startling reality that Jesus says there will be a day where a realization will come to those who didn't really have a love for their Redeemer. Oh, they had a resume, and they did some rituals, and they were very good at religion. But they didn't live in love with Christ. This realization, friends, is something you and I have to get comfortable with, comfortable enough to share, to not just live out, but to share, to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And here's the thing. It'll be messy if you do it right. If it's not messy, you're not doing it right. Look at Jesus' ministry. Look at the ministry of Paul. Look at the ministry of Peter, Timothy. Go through your Bible. Look at the prophets of the Old Testament. Find yourself those speaking and living on behalf of God, and you show me the easy street. Friends, there's some realization that needs to be shared, and there's some realization that needs to be embraced. Listen as Neil Cole talks to a group at the Verge Conference of people like you and me, people with a heart for God who want to make a difference and are looking to be equipped. I pray that this realization and this understanding of our call to get messy for and with our Messiah is personal to you and me. Listen to Neil. Life is messy, isn't it? You hear all these stories on the stage, and you hear all the glory stories of how everything turned out all right. I think you need a gory story, don't you? You need a story that's more like life, messy. Well, the third church I ever had the joy of planting was when a drug dealer gave his life to Christ. And then we started a church in his crack house, and all of his clients came to Christ. Boom, 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 boom. This is sounding like a glory story now, isn't it? It was awesome days. For six years, this church sent off church planters all over the world, and this drug dealer was quite an evangelist. He just kept leading people to Christ. He was an entrepreneur, had his own business that was thriving and succeeding, and he would lead his workers to Christ. These were great days. Unfortunately, they came to an end. The drug dealer fell back into drugs. A lot of his clients went back into drugs. And we had to take the church out of the crack house and move it into the suburbs. And uh, to this day, he's on again, off again, on again, off again. I would love to say for the rest of his life, he walked with Jesus and led thousands to Christ. But it didn't happen. Life's messy. Even the best disciple makers will have these kinds of messes in their life. You just need to be ready for it. Jesus had Judas... Paul had Demas, and somebody's going to break your heart, or you're not doing something right. If you're not investing all your emotions into a relationship with someone that you love, then you're not doing something right. But if you do invest all that you are into somebody, somebody's going to disappoint you and break your heart. Now, there are some things the Bible tells us about selection of disciples. Where you start will determine where you end. And God works on a whole different economy than the rest of us. What we think is up is actually down. What we think is right is actually wrong. What we think is first is actually last. And so when God wants to start a movement, he doesn't begin with the best people. He starts with the broken. So here's what the Bible says about good soil for the gospel. And that's what we want. We want good soil to start with, where we plant that seed and it's going to bear forth fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. We found that bad people make good soil. There's a lot of fertilizer in their life. (laughs) If you really want to see something with grow, go where there's a lot of dark soil, good fertilizer. It stinks. It's messy, but it's going to birth something. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You don't call a doctor when you're well. You call a doctor when you're sick. Look for sick people. Bad people make good soil. Young people make good soil. Jesus said, didn't I not come, that Jesus said that unless you come to Christ as a small child, you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, there's no one who's better at being a small child than a small child. 
How many of you, raise your hand if you accepted Christ before you were 20? Look around the room, folks. There's good soil <laughs> when they were young. Not so much now. <laughs> They're old and callous now. <laughs> young people make good soil. Poor people make good soil. James writes, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of heaven? Poor people make good soil. Not all poor people, not all young people, not all bad people, but you're going to find more receptive people in that kind of soil than you will in other soil. Paul writes, for consider your calling, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and following. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world. And the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are for this reason, so that God might get the glory. He loves to do things backwards. You know, you know who wrote the gospel, the gospel for the Jews? Matthew. Where did Jesus find Matthew? In that tax office. Do you know the Jews in the first century hated a lot of people, but they especially hated tax collectors. That's why Matthew often writes that Jesus was with the sinners and the tax collectors. There's a special room in hell just for tax collectors. So when God wants to write his gospel to the Jews, if it were me, I'd have gone to the temple. I'd have found the most righteous, most respected Pharisee, the most intelligent man of the bunch, and had him write my gospel so that everyone would read it. But he doesn't. He goes to the tax office and finds the most despised person, transforms his life, and he writes his message for the Jews. Now, when God wants to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, where does he go? To the temple to find the smartest, most self-righteous Pharisee and sends him to the Gentiles. He does things backwards. So we've got to learn to understand Jesus sees people differently than we do. It's harder for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. We've got to open our eyes and look on the fields that are white for a harvest, and sometimes those fields are not what we expected. And if you allow it to happen, God will surprise you with beautiful things. I learned this a long time ago. Don't invest in potential. Raise your hand if you have potential. Everybody in the room has but Everybody on the planet has potential. It's, a, it's wonderful to have lots of potential, especially when you're young, right? Oh, he has so much potential. It's no longer a wonderful thing when they stand at, stand at your gravesite and say, oh, he had so much potential. <laughs> potential is a zero. It's an empty vacuum that says someday you're going to fill this with something, but it's nothing right now. If you multiply nothing, zero, by a million, you still have what? Zero. Don't invest in potential. Invest in provenness. Obedience to Jesus. Simple faith and obedience. Invest there. He who is faithful with a few things will be faithful with more. And learn to invest in the people that are obeying Jesus. And when they stop obeying Jesus, you pull back until they get back on board again. Then you start investing again. This is the way to save yourself a lot of heartache. You'll still have your Judas. You'll still have your Demas. But you'll have far less of them if you invest in provenness instead of potential. Now, Jesus loved everybody, but he invested in the two or three. Now, how many know verses that mention two or three? You can't even read that. It says two or three. That's where discipleship happens, life on life. Those two or three were part of another circle where you have family, and that's 12 to 15. And Jesus walked with a band of 12 to 15. And beyond that, you have your, your team, your building team. And that's 25 to 75 people. And that's the best stages to train people. Give them some, you get to know them, you give them an assignment, they go out and try it, they make a mistake, they come back, you say, hey, I love you anyway, try it again. And you debrief and you give more training. This is the best group to have training. Family is the best group for intimacy, but it's not a very good group for coming up with a decision. That's why Satan has convinced us to have committees to make decisions. 
The next size grouping is 120 to 150. And this is your flock or your, your clan. Sociologists tell us that 150, they call it the Dunbar number, at that point where you stop, you, 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 you can only have this many close friends up to 150. Beyond that, they're not that intimate anymore. You might know a lot more people, but this is the defined by if you run into somebody in the restaurant from your group of 150, you will just invite yourself to sit at their table. You'll just shove them over and sit down. You don't have to be invited because you're part of their clan. You can only have up to 150 people like that until Facebook came along. <laughs> now, actually, Dunbar did a study of Facebook, and it still proves true. The next size grouping is 300 to 500. This is the best size grouping to uh, cast vision of an important idea that they will then take it and run with it and cast it to others. In a short period of time, to get an idea across as quickly as possible, gather them in, in, in a group like this. And then beyond that, you just have unlimited multitudes. Now, where did Jesus start? He sent them off in pairs of twos. But those twos were a part of his 12. Those 12 were a part of the 70 that he trained and sent off. Those 70 were a part of the 120 that he left behind when he ascended into heaven. Apparently, he missed the How to Break the 200 Barrier seminar. <laughs> he appeared, risen from the dead, to 500 people at one time to cast a vision that they could take on. And he fed and he healed and he... Uh, he preached to the multitudes. It's okay to, to want to work with every size grouping, but don't try to make whatever group you have do everything. And I think where you need to start is at the bullseye. All right? Aim for the bullseye, folks. Two or three. Your church is only as good as her disciples. No matter how good your show is on Sunday, no matter how many people come, Ultimately, your church is evaluated by the quality of your disciples. So multiply healthy groups of two or three. That's where it starts. That's where the selection begins. Look for broken people. Look for hurting people. Give them the gospel, and the gospel will change their life. And that changed life is the energy of movement. You cannot manufacture movement with any other kind of energy. You can't buy it with a dollar or a million dollars. You can't engineer it. Movement only comes by the power of the gospel transforming a broken life. So if you really want to release movement, look for the broken, the not many who are noble, that are righteous, that are educated, that are wise. Look for the people that aren't and give your life there. I hope and pray that my friend, the drug dealer, who still keeps in touch with me and his wife is still walking with Jesus, I hope he turns his life around. But I'm not going to wait for him. My time's too short. My life's too short to spend investing in poor soil. I want to invest my life where it's going to bear forth fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And I think you should do the same. Here's an idea. Let's do what Jesus said. Let's do what Jesus demonstrated. Friends, again, I bring to you the call to realization. Realization that will impact yours and my heart for the lost. And realization that you and I have been given a blueprint, biblically, from our king. He's told us how to go and be. My prayer is that that's what you and I will do. It brings us to the finalization for tonight our last segment, and here we see that all that we're talking about, all that we've been called to embrace, has an eternal impact. And I just want to leave you tonight with that question. Have you come to grips with the fact that everything that we're talking about has an eternal impact? And that eternal impact has both the positive and the negative for those who walk and talk and live and self-righteous indignation, perhaps religious, but not in a relationship expressed through faithful obedience where one has been saved by grace and living out that. 
there's an eternal impact. At the same time, if, Christian, you have been saved and you are an ambassador of the king and you are the aroma of Christ and you live on mission and you have that burning passion to share Christ, then you, my friends, have been set free, not just from the world down here, but eternally set free. And there should be an eternal zeal and joy and passion that we can't contain, that our lives are so done with the distractions and the dilutions of this world that we live on fire for Christ. Friends, I pray, I want to leave you with Romans 1. If you read Romans 1, verses 16 through 18, here again, one of the most powerful places in the Bible, you see the inspirational call, the overwhelming joyful promise, and the reality of the consequence for rejection. Listen to these three verses, and and I want you to note, without hesitation or separation, listen to how verse 17 and verse 18, literally together, how eternal the contrast. First, the inspiration, Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, here's the promise. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now listen to the cold raw consequence of that which is rejecting this beautiful truth for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth have you ever walked through those three verses of Romans 1 incredible inspiration eternal promise and perspective to the glory of God for we as children and the stark, startling reminder of what happens eternally. The wrath of God comes upon those who reject. And again, I point you to the parable of the soils. Do not be fooled by fact regurgitation, feeling exuberation, where even the proclamation of faith, look for the fruit that speaks to the root that is Christ Jesus. Friends, you and I have an eternal impact to celebrate and to share. Eric Ludi will close us from our training tonight with a proclamation and a declaration that is beautifully eternal. And I pray you and I will come to share this with others. Know it in our soul and share it with all that we come to meet. Let's watch this and then I'll close us in prayer. going to introduce you to the gospel right now. You are a rebel. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, I'll tell you straight up. You are a rebel against the living God. This is your natural disposition. Why? Because you are born in sin. We are in a prison cell. And it takes the awakening and the grace of God, you call it the provenient grace of God, to awaken us to the fact that we are lost and we can't get out. We're headed towards destruction fast. The enemy, because of our rebellion against God, has legal rights to harm and harass our life. There you are behind the prison cell. Help! I need out! You can't get out. Those prison bars are stronger than any adamant. There is no way you can cut them because they're stronger than diamond. It is impenetrable. You cannot escape. You're doomed because when the enemy comes in in the very end and he's going to finish you off because he has legal right to do it and he's going to relish every minute of it. In strolls your intercessor, your mighty man. And he stands between you and that accuser 
and he takes the hit that was rightfully yours. He takes the blow that was intended for you. That is an extraordinary reality that he was turned to a pulp and he actually died. God died for you. Over your prison cell, it has always said condemned, separated eternally from God, guilty. And then suddenly it switches. When you realize what Jesus Christ has done, it says justified. It says forgiven, redeemed. Here's the problem. Most of us have stopped with the good news right there. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed and he was killed. And I want you to know that is unbelievable news. But we are still in a prison cell. And so we're praising God from within a prison cell going, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for changing the sign on the outside of the prison. And God's word says, could you check the door to the prison cell? Because my blood was shed for more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness was the avenue through which he could make the escape for us. He isn't just interested in dealing with the consequences or the penalty of sin. He's also dealt with the problem of sin. Test the door. It's unlocked. The door to the prison cell is unlocked. Walk out. Smell the open air of freedom and liberty in the life of Jesus Christ. When you get outside the prison cell, there's like this chariot that's waiting. Emissaries from the king, and they say the king beckons you into his presence. You know how bizarre this is when you realize that you were a rebel? That you were undeserving completely? The living God has literally given up his life for you. And now he has set you free. And now the very king is beckoning you into his presence. It's like, are you sure you have the right guy here? I'm a rebel. I, I stood against my God. I spat in his face. How, how could he want me? The king beckons you. You get in the chariot. And as you're pulling into the kingdom, you're looking for where they might drop you off. You're looking for that poor district. You're saying, where, where are you taking me? Well, into the very near presence of the king. He wants you to live right where he lives. Not just the penalty, not just the problem, but an invitation into his very near presence. But as you're coming in, the emissaries say, he wants to adopt you as his child. Me? We are brought in and invited near to share his heart. You come into his presence totally broken before the reality of what he has done for you. I don't deserve this. Why have you done this for me? I love you. I have a commission for you. For me? You want to have me work for you? I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I took you out of because there's a whole bunch more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. Will you go for me? In a heartbeat, I would, I would gladly serve you any way you want, any way you ask. I need to forewarn you. I'm gonna send you out and you'll be as a sheep among wolves. They'll kill you. They'll destroy you, they'll hate you, they'll persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I'm in. I'll do it, God. I don't care. You shed your blood for me. I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body. Take my blood. Spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus. Send me. The commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the King of Kings, but we are commissioned to represent him and I want you to realize that it's a privilege beyond all other privileges to bear the very name the very image the very reputation of God Almighty and he says I ask you to go go and make disciples of all men go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it go rescue the lost in the power of my name for it's not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, hold it. Wait, there's one more thing. 
not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as the son or a daughter of the king, and not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one. Because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering. It is so extraordinary, so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go, what I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? Because then we go into this world as little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down. Because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God mocks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs. Because his lambs beat the wolf pack. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon all the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the manifold wisdom of God that he is in control. And even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. That is good news. And it is a lot better than what's being dealt out today in the church. We need to rise up, proclaim the gospel, and say, I'm unashamed of it. Dear Lord Jesus, take what is rightfully yours. Don't just send us. Send us with yourself. Firmly planted within our souls. We cannot do your work. We cannot bring you glory. Even though we're willing to do it without you. Please, if you want to come with us, why in the world would we ever try on our own? You don't have to go on your own. You don't have to pull off the impossible on your own. You don't have to fail any longer. Your God is ready to do it in and through you. You can't do it. You can't muster up the discipline. You can't muster up the intellect. You can't muster up the strength. You can't muster up the perseverance and the fortitude. He can. You can't love the lost. You can't love those that spit upon your face. He can. Don't pray that God would teach you how to love like he loves. Pray that he would fill you with himself and he would love in and through you. Don't pray that he would teach you to have joy. Pray that the living God full of joy would enter into you. Don't pray that he would teach you how to be peaceful. Ask for the God of peace, the Prince of Peace to infill you. Because if you try and imitate in your own strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, suddenly it all works because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God. I ask you, do you see with eternal eyes the eternal lies of Satan? Do you see with eternal eyes 
the eternal truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us go forward as ambassadors of Christ, aroma of Christ, empowered by his spirit, driven with his love, all for his glory and all by his grace. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for your truth, your love, and the light of your word. Father, I thank you that you love us enough that you would come with your chisel and that you would refine us, that you would fill us with your truth, that you would shower us with your love, that you would privilege us with this call. It's my prayer, Lord Jesus, that we would come to see with biblical eyes the relationship of creation to Christianity, selection, direction, application, fascination, illumination, sensation, maturation, dedication, separation, multiplication, realization, and the finalization of your gospel. I pray on behalf of this people and those that you will privilege us to touch in the next seconds and minutes and for the decades that will fill the rest of our lives. Use us, Lord Jesus, and thank you for choosing us through your cross. In your grace. For your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I'll leave you tonight with a video that was created to kind of summarize this to the song by Sidewalk Prophets that I pray will just simply help you to remember this night and maybe go back and walk with Jesus through these truths. Thank you for coming. I want to see your face clear as the midnight stars I want to feel your love like a train running through my heart
on fire.